The first place that I can well remember was a large pleasant meadow with a pond of clear water in it. Over the hedge on one side we looked into a ploughed field, and on the other we looked over a gate at our master's house. Whilst I was young I lived upon my mother's milk, but as soon as I was old enough to eat grass, my mother used to go out to work in the daytime and came back in the evening. There were six young colts in the meadow besides me. I used to run with them and had great fun. We used to gallop all together round and round the field as hard as we could go. Our master was a good, kind man. When she saw him at the gate, my mother would neigh with joy and trot up to him. He would pat her and say, Well, old pet, and how is your little darky? I was a dull black, so he called me darky. Then he would give me a piece of bread and sometimes he brought a carrot for my mother. All the horses would come to him, but I think we were his favourites. Before I was two years old, a circumstance happened which I have never forgotten. I and the other colts were feeding when we heard what sounded like the cry of dogs. The oldest of the colts raised his head and said, There are the harmons. They have found a hare, said my mother, and if they come this way we shall see the hunt. And soon the dogs were all tearing down the field of young wheat next to ours. After them came a number of men on horseback all galloping as fast as they could. Now we shall see the hare, said my mother. And just then a hare, wild with fright, rushed by and tried to get through the fence. But it was too thick, and she turned sharp round to make for the road, but it was too late. The dogs were upon her with their wild cries. One of the huntsmen rode up and whipped off the dogs, then held her up by the leg, torn and bleeding. All the gentlemen seemed well pleased. As for me... I was so astonished that I did not at first see what was going on by the brook. But when I did look, there was a sad sight. Two fine horses were down. One of the riders was getting out of the water covered with mud. The other lay quite still. His neck is broken, said my mother. I heard afterwards that it was young George Gordon, the squire's only son, a fine, tall young man and the pride of his family. There was now riding off in all directions, to the doctors, to the farriers, and no doubt to Squire Gordon's, to let him know about his son. The black horse lay groaning on the grass. Then someone came back with a gun. Presently there was a loud bang and a dreadful shriek, and the black horse moved no more. My mother seemed much troubled. She said she'd known that horse for years, and that his name was Rob Roy. He was a good, bold horse, and there was no vice in him. Not many days after, we heard the church bell tolling. They were carrying young Gordon to the churchyard to bury him. What they did with Rob Roy I never knew. But t'was all for one little hare. I was now beginning to grow handsome. My coat had grown fine and soft and was bright black. I had one white foot and a pretty white star on my forehead. When I was four years old, Squire Gordon came to look at me. He seemed to like me and said, When he has been well broken in, he will do very well. Now everyone may not know what breaking in is, therefore I will describe it. It means to teach a horse to wear a saddle and bridle, and to carry on his back a man, woman or child, to go just the way they wish and to go quietly. Besides this, he has to learn to wear a collar, crupper, and a breeching, and to stand still whilst they are put on, then to have a cart or a chaise fixed behind him, so that he cannot walk or trot without dragging it after him, and he must go fast or slow, just as his driver wishes. But the worst of all is, when his harness is once on, he may neither jump for joy nor lie down for weariness. So you see, this breaking in is a great thing. My master got the bit into my mouth and the bridle fixed, but it was a nasty thing. Those who have never had a bit in their mouths cannot think how bad it feels. A great piece of cold, hard steel as thick as a man's finger to be pushed into one's mouth. But what with the night nice oats and what with my master's pats, kind words and gentle ways, I got to wear my bit and bridle. Next came the saddle, but that was not half so bad. My master put it on my back very gently and then made the girths fast under my body. 
The next unpleasant business was putting on the iron shoes. That too was very hard at first. My master went with me to the smith's forge to see that I was not hurt or got any fright. My feet felt very stiff and heavy, but in time I got used to it. And now, having got so far, my master went on to break me to harness. There were more new things to wear. I hated the crupper. To have my long tail doubled up and poked through that strap was almost as bad as the bit. I never felt more like kicking. But of course I could not kick such a good master, and so in time I got used to everything. My master often drove me in double harness with my mother because she was steady. She told me, the better I behaved, the better I should be treated. But, she said, there are a great many kinds of men. There are good, thoughtful men like our master, but there are bad, cruel men who never ought to have a horse or dog to call their own. I hope you will fall into good hands. But a horse never knows who may buy him. Do your best wherever it is, and keep up your good name. It was early in May when there came a man from Squire Gordon's who took me away to the hall. My master said, Goodbye, Darky. Be a good horse and always do your best. Squire Gordon's park skirted the village of Birtwick. It was entered by a large iron gate. Then you trotted along on a smooth road between clumps of large old trees, which brought you to the house and the gardens. Beyond this lay the home paddock, the old orchard, and the stables. The stable into which I was taken was very roomy, with four good stalls. In the stall next to mine stood a little fat grey pony with a thick mane and tail, a very pretty head, and a pert little nose. I put my head up to the iron railings at the top of my box and said, How do you do? What is your name? He turned round as far as his halter would allow and said, My name is Mary Lakes. I am very handsome. I carry the young ladies on my back. They think a great deal of me and so does James. Are you going to live next door to me in the box? I said, Yes. Well then, he said, I hope you are good-tempered. I do not like anyone next door who bites. Just then a horse's head looked over from the store beyond. The ears were laid back, and the eye looked rather ill-tempered. This was a tall chestnut mare with a long, handsome neck. She looked across to me and said, So, it is you who have turned me out of my box. It is a very strange thing for a colt like you to come and turn a lady out of her own home. I beg your pardon, I said. I've turned no one out. The man who brought me here put me here, and I had nothing to do with it. Well, she said, we shall see. Of course, I do not want to have words with a young thing like you. In the afternoon when she went out, Mary Lakes told me all about it. The thing is this, said Mary Lakes. Ginger has a bad habit of biting and snapping. One day she bit James in the arm and made it bleed, and so Miss Flora and Miss Jessie, who are very fond of me, were afraid to come into the stable. Of course, it is a very bad habit. I am sure if all she says be true, she must have been very ill-used before she came here. John does all he can to please her, and James does all he can, and our master never uses a whip if a horse acts right. John is the best groom that ever was. And you never saw such a kind boy as James. So you see, it's Ginger's fault that you took her place in that box. The name of the coachman was John Manley. He had a wife and one little child, and they lived in the coachman's cottage very near the stables. After breakfast, he came and fitted me with a bridle. He rode me first slowly, then a trot, then a canter, and when we were on the common, he gave me a light touch with his whip, and we had a splendid gallop. As we came back through the park, we met the squire and Mrs. Gordon walking. They stopped, and John jumped off. Well, John, how does he go? First rate, sir, answered John. He is as fleet as a deer, and has a fine spirit, too, but the lightest touch of the rain will guide him. That's well, said the squire. I will try him myself tomorrow. 
The next day I was brought up for my master. I found he was a very good rider and thoughtful for his horse too. When he came home, the lady was at the hall door as he rode up. Well, my dear, she said, how do you like him? He is exactly what John said, he replied. A pleasanter creature I never wish to mount. What shall we call him? Would you like Ebony, she said. He is as black as Ebony. No, not Ebony. Will you call him Blackbird, like your uncle's horse? No, he's far handsomer than old Blackbird ever was. Yes, yeah, she said. He is really quite a beauty, and he has such a sweet, good-tempered face, and such a fine, intelligent eye. What do you say to calling him Black Beauty? Black Beauty. Why, yes, I think it is a very good name. If you like it, it shall be his name. So it was. One day when Ginger and I were standing alone in the shade, we had a great deal of talk. She said, If I had had your bringing up, I might have been as good-tempered as you are, but now I don't believe I ever shall. Why not, I said. Because it has all been so different with me, she replied. I never had anyone, horse or man, that was kind to me. There was one man, the old master, Mr. Ryder, who I think could soon have brought me round and could have done anything with me, but he had given up all the hard part of the trade to his son. A strong, tall, bold man, they called him Samson, and he used to boast that he had never found a horse that could throw him. One day he worked me hard in every way he could. I felt my whole spirit set against him, and I began to kick and plunge and rear. For a long time he stuck to the saddle and punished me cruelly with his whip and spurs, but my blood was thoroughly up, and I cared for nothing he could do if only I could get him off. At last, after a terrible struggle, I threw him off backwards. I heard him fall heavily on the turf, and without looking behind me, I galloped off to the other end of the field. There I turned round and saw my persecutor slowly rising from the ground and going into the stable. At last, just as the sun went down, the old master came out. He stood by, patting and stroking me, and seeing the clots of blood on my side. He seemed very vexed. Poor lassie. It was a bad business. A bad business. Then he quietly took the rein and led me to the stable. Just at the door stood Samson. I laid my ears back and snapped at him. Stand back, said the master, and keep out of our way. You've done a bad day's work for this filly. He growled out something about a vicious brute. Arky, said the father, a bad-tempered man will never make a good-tempered horse. Well, I said, I think it would be a real shame if you were to bite or kick John or James. I don't mean to, she said, while they are good to me. I did bite James once pretty sharp. But John said, try her with kindness. And instead of punishing me as I expected, James came to me with his arm bound up and brought me a bran mash and stroked me. I have never snapped at him since, and I won't either. The longer I lived at Birtwick, the more proud and happy I felt at having such a place. Our master and mistress were respected and beloved by all who knew them, they were good and kind to everybody and everything. Not only men and women, but horses and donkeys, dogs and cats, cattle and birds. There was no oppressed or ill-used creature that had not a friend in them, and their servants took the same tone. If any of the village children were known to treat any creature cruelly, they soon heard about it from the hall. One day it was decided by my master and mistress to pay a visit to some friends who lived about 46 miles from our home, and James was to drive them. The first day, we travelled about 32 miles. There were some long, heavy hills, but James drove so carefully and thoughtfully that we were not at all harassed. We stopped once or twice on the road, and just as the sun was going down, 
we reached the town where we were to spend the night. We stopped at the principal hotel, which was in the marketplace, and two ostlers came to take us out. The head ostler was a pleasant, active little man with a crooked leg and a yellow striped waistcoat. I never saw a man unbuckle harness so quickly as he did, and with a pat and a good word, he led me to a long stable with six or eight stalls in it and two or three horses. The other man brought Ginger. James stood by whilst we were rubbed down and cleaned. I never was cleaned so lightly and quickly as by that little old man. When he had done, James stepped up and felt me over, as if he thought I could not be thoroughly done. But he found my coat as clean and smooth as silk. Well, he said, I thought I was pretty quick, and ah, John, quicker still. But you do beat all I ever saw for being quick and thorough at the same time. <laughs> Practice makes perfect, said the crooked little ostler. Hunt would be a pity if it didn't. Forty years practice and not perfect. Oh, <laughs> that would be a pity. Give me the handling of a horse for twenty minutes, and I'll tell you what sort of a groom he's had. Look at this one. Pleasant, quiet, turns about just as you want him. Then you'll find another. Fidgety, fretty, won't move the right way. Or else squares about at you with his heels. Poor things. I know what sort of treatment they have had. If they are timid, it makes them start or shy. If they are high-mettled, it makes them vicious or dangerous. Their tempers are mostly made up when they are young, bless you. They are like children. Train them up in the way they should go, as the good book says. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. If they have a chance, that is. I like to hear you talk, said James. That's the way we lay it down at our own, at our master's. During this time, the other man had finished ginger and had brought our corn, and James and the old man left the stable together. Later on in the evening, a traveller's horse was brought in by the second ostler, and whilst he was cleaning him, a young man with a pipe in his mouth lounged into the stable to gossip. I say, Tola, said the ostler. Just run up the ladder into the loft and put some hay down in this horse's rack, will you? Only lay down your pipe. All right, said the other, and went up through the trap door, and I heard him step across the floor overhead and put down the hay. James came in to look at us the last thing, and then the door was locked. I cannot say how long I had slept, nor what time in the night it was, but I woke up very uncomfortable though I hardly knew why. I got up. The air seemed all thick and choking. I heard Ginger coughing, and one of the other horses moved about restlessly. It was quite dark, and I could see nothing. But the stable was very full of smoke, and I hardly knew how to breathe. The trap door had been left open, and I thought that that was the place it came through. I listened and heard a soft rushing sort of noise and a low crackling and snapping. I did not know what it was, but there was something in the sound so strange that it made me tremble all over. The other horses were now all awake. Some were pulling at their halters, others were stamping. At last I heard steps outside, and the ostler who had put up the traveller's horse burst into the stable with a lantern and began to untie the horses and try to lead them out. But he seemed in such a hurry and, and so frightened himself that he frightened me still more. The first horse would not go with him. He tried the second and third. They too would not stir. He came to me next and tried to drag me out of the stall by force. Of course, that was no use. He tried us all by turns and then left the stable. No doubt we were very foolish. A danger seemed to be all round, and there was nobody we knew to trust in, and all was strange and uncertain. The fresh air that had come in through the open door made it easier to breathe, but the rushing sound overhead grew louder, and as I looked upward through the bars of my empty rack, I saw a red light flickering on the wall. Then I heard a cry of, Fire! outside, and the old ostler quietly and quickly came in. 
He got one horse out and went to another. But the flames were playing round the trap door, and the roaring overhead was dreadful. The next thing I heard was James's voice, quiet and cheery as it always was. Come, my beauties, it's time for us to be off, so wake up and come along. I stood nearest the door, so he came to me first, patting me as he came in. Come, beauty, on with your bridle, my boy. We'll soon be out of this smother. It was on in no time, and he took the scarf off his neck and tied it lightly over my eyes, patting and coaxing me out of the stable. Safe in the yard, he slipped the scarf off my eyes and shouted, Here, somebody! Take this horse while I go back for the other. A tall, broad man stepped forward and took me, and James darted back into the stable. I set up a shrill whinny as I saw him go. Ginger told me afterwards that whinny was the best thing I could have done for her, for had she not heard me outside, she would never have had the courage to come out. There was much confusion in the yard, the horses being got out of other stables, and the carriages and gigs being pulled out of the houses and sheds, lest the flames should spread further. On the other side of the yard, windows were thrown up, and people were shouting all sorts of things, but I kept my eye fixed on the stable door where the smoke poured out thicker than ever, and I could see flashes of red light. Presently, I heard above all the stir and din a loud, clear voice, which I knew was Master's. James Howard! James Howard! Are you there? There was no answer, but I heard a crash of something falling in the stable, and the next moment I gave a loud, joyful neigh, for I saw James coming through the smoke, leading Ginger with him. She was coughing violently, and he was not able to speak. My brave lad, said Master, laying his hand on his shoulder. Are you hurt? James shook his head, for he could not yet speak. Aye, said the big man who held me. He is a brave lad, and no mistake. And now, said Master, when you've got your breath, James, we'll get out of this place as quickly as we can. And we were moving towards the entry, when from the marketplace there came a sound of galloping feet and loud rumbling wheels. "'Tis the fire engine! The fire engine!' shouted two or three voices. "'Stand back! Make way!' Clattering and thundering over the stones, two horses dashed into the yard with a heavy engine behind them. The firemen leapt to the ground. There was no need to ask where the fire was. It was torching up in a great blaze from the roof. We got out as fast as we could into the broad, quiet marketplace. The stars were shining, and except for the noise behind us, all was still. There was a dreadful sound before we got into our stalls. The shrieks of those poor horses that were left burning to death in the stable. It was very terrible, and made Ginger and me feel very bad. We, however, were taken in and well done by the next morning, the master came to see how we were and speak to James. At first, no one could guess how the fire had been caused. But at last, the under ostler said he had asked Dick to go up the ladder to put down some hay, but told him to lay down his pipe first. Dick denied taking the pipe with him, but no one believed him. James said the roof and floor had fallen in and that only the black walls were standing. The two poor horses that could not be got out were buried under the burnt rafters and tiles. The rest of the journey was very easy, and a little after sunset we reached the house of my master's friend. We were taken into a clean, snug stable. There was a kind coachman who made us very comfortable and who seemed to think a good deal of James when he heard about the fire. There is one thing quite clear, young man, he said. Your horses know who they can trust. It is one of the hardest things in the world to get a horse out of the stable when there is either fire or flood. I don't know why they won't come out, but they won't. Not one in twenty. We stopped two or three days in this place and then returned home. All went well on the journey, and we were glad to be in our own stable again. 
and John was equally glad to see us. One night, a few days later, I had eaten my hay and was laid down in my straw fast asleep, when I was suddenly awoken by the stable bell ringing very loud. I heard the door of John's house open and his feet running up to the hall. He was back again in no time. He unlocked the stable door and came in calling out, Wake up, beauty. You must go well now if ever you did. And he took me at a quick trot up to the hall door. The squire stood there with a lamp in his hand. Now, John, he said, ride for your life. That is for your mistress's life. There is not a moment to lose. Give this note to Dr. White. Give your horse a rest at the inn and be back as soon as you can. John said to me, Now, beauty, do your best. And so I did. I wanted no whip nor spur, and for two miles I galloped as fast as I could lay my feet on the ground. When we came into the marketplace, it was all quite still except for the clatter of my feet on the stones. Everybody was asleep. The church clock struck three as we drew up at Dr. White's door. John rang the bell twice and then knocked at the door like thunder. A window was thrown up and Dr. White in his nightcap put his head out and said, What do you want? Mrs. Gordon is very ill, sir. Master wants you to go at once. He thinks she will die if you cannot get there. Here is a note. Wait, he said. I will come. He shut the window and was soon at the door. The worst of it is, he said, that my horse has been out all day and is quite done up. My son has just been sent for and he has taken the other. What is to be done? Can I have your horse? He has come at a gallop all the way, sir, and I was to give him a rest here. But I think my master would not be against it, if you think fit, sir. All right, he said. I will soon be ready. John stood by me and stroked my neck. I was very hot. The doctor came out with his riding whip. You need not take that, sir, said John. Black beauty will go till he drops. Take care of him, sir, if you can. I should not like any harm to come to him. No, no, John, said the doctor. I hope not. And in a minute we'd left John far behind. I will not tell about our way back. The doctor was a heavier man than John and not so good a rider. However, I did my very best. My master was at the hall door, for he'd heard us coming. He spoke not a word as the doctor went into the house with him. I was glad to get home. My legs shook under me, and I could only stand and pant. I had not a dry hair on my body, and the water ran down my legs, and I steamed all over. Joe Green, the new groom, rubbed my legs and my chest, but he did not put my warm cloth on me. He thought I was so hot I should not like it. Then he gave me a pail full of water to drink. It was cold and very good, and I drank it all. Then he gave me some hay and some corn, and thinking he had done right, he went away. Soon I began to shake and tremble and turn deadly cold. My legs ached, my loins ached, my chest ached, and I felt sore all over. Oh, how I wished for my warm, thick cloth as I stood and trembled. I wished for John, but he had eight miles to walk. So I lay down in my straw and tried to go to sleep. After a long while, I heard John at the door. I gave a low moan, for I was in great pain. He was at my side in a moment, stooping down by me. Could not tell him how I felt, but he seemed to know it all. He covered me up with two or three warm cloths and then ran to the house for some hot water. He made me some warm gruel, which I drank, and then I think I went to sleep. John seemed to be very much put out. I heard him say to himself over and over again, Stupid boy, stupid boy. No cloth put on, and I dare say the water was cold too. Boys are no good. But Joe was a good boy after all. I was now very ill. A strong inflammation had attacked my lungs, and I could not draw my breath without pain. John nursed me night and day. He would get up two or three times in the night to come to me. My master, too, often came to see me. My poor beauty, he said one day. My good horse. You saved your mistress's life, beauty. Yes, you saved her life. 
I was very glad to hear that, for it seems the doctor had said if we'd been a little longer it would have been too late. John told my master he never saw a horse go so fast in his life. It seemed, he said, as if the horse knew what was the matter. I do not know how long I was ill. Mr. Bond, the horse doctor, came every day. One day he bled me. John held a pail for the blood. I felt very faint after it and thought I should die. And I believe they all thought so too. Ginger and Merrylegs had been moved into the other stables so that I might be quiet. One night John had to give me a draught. Thomas Green came in to help him. After I had taken it, and John had made me as comfortable as he could, he said he should stay half an hour to see how the medicine settled. Thomas said he would stay with him. So they went and sat down on a bench that had been brought into Merrylegs' stall and put down the lantern at their feet that I might not be disturbed with the light. As it happened, the medicine did well and sent me to sleep. And in the morning, I felt much, much better. Despite his early setback, Joe Green went on very well. He learned quickly and was so attentive and careful that John began to trust him in many things. It so happened one morning that the master wanted a note to be taken immediately to a gentleman's house, about three miles distant, and sent his orders for Joe to saddle me and take it, adding the caution that he was to ride carefully. The note was delivered, and we were quietly returning till we came to the brickfield. Here we saw a cart heavily laden with bricks. The wheels had stuck fast in the stiff mud of some deep ruts, and the carter was shouting and flogging the two horses unmercifully. Joe pulled up. It was a sad sight. There were the two horses straining and struggling with all their might to drag the cart out, but they could not move it. The sweat streamed from their legs and flanks. Their sides heaved, and every muscle was strained, whilst the man, fiercely pulling at the head of the forehorse, swore and lashed most brutally. Stop! Pray stop! said Joe. I'll help you to lighten the cart. They can't move it now. Mind your own business, you impotent young rascal, and I'll mind mine. The man was in a towering passion, and the worse for drink, and laid on the whip again. Joe turned my head, and the next moment we were going at a round gallop towards the house of the master brickmaker. The house stood close by the roadside. Joe knocked at the door and shouted, Hello! Is Mr. Clay at home? The door was opened and Mr. Clay himself came out. Hello, young man, you seem in a hurry. Any orders from the squire this morning? No, Mr. Clay, but there's a fellow in your brickyard flogging two horses to death. I told him to stop and he wouldn't. I said I'd help him to lighten the cart, and he wouldn't. So I have to come to tell you. Pray, sir, go. Joe's voice shook with excitement. Thank you, my lad, said the man, running in for his hat. Then pausing for a moment. Will you give evidence of what you saw if I should bring the fellow up before the magistrate? That I will, said Joe, and glad to. The man was gone, and we were on our way home at a smart trot. Why? What's the matter with you, Joe? You look angry all over, said John, as the boy flung himself from the saddle. I am angry all over, I can tell you, said the boy. And then in hurried, excited words, he told all that had happened. Joe was usually such a quiet, gentle little fellow that it was wonderful to see him so roused. They were just going home to dinner when the footman came to the stable to say that Joe was wanted directly in Master's private room. There was a man brought up for ill-using horses, and Joe's evidence was wanted. The boy flushed up to his forehead, and his eyes sparkled. They shall have it, he said. We heard afterwards that he had given his evidence so clearly, and the horses were in such an exhausted state, bearing marks of such brutal usage, that the carter was committed to take his trial, and might possibly be sentenced to two or three months in prison. I had now lived in this happy place three years, but sad changes were about to come over us. We heard from time to time that our mistress was ill. Then we heard she must leave her home at once and go to a warm country for two or three years. 
everybody was sorry. But the master began directly to make arrangements for breaking up his establishment and leaving England. John went about his work silent and sad, and Joe scarcely whistled. There was a great deal of coming and going. Ginger and I had full work. The first of the party who went were Miss Jessie and Flora with their governess. They came to bid us goodbye. They hugged poor Merrylegs like an old friend, and so indeed he was. Then we heard what had been arranged for us. Master had sold Ginger and me to his old friend, the Earl of Wendover, for he thought we should have a good place there. Merrylegs he had given to the vicar, who was wanting a pony for Mrs. Blomfield. But it was on the condition that he should never be sold. Joe was engaged to take care of him and to help in the house, so I thought Merrylegs was well off. The last sad day had come. The footman and the heavy luggage had gone off the day before, and there was only master and mistress and her maid. Ginger and I brought the carriage up to the hall for the last time. The servants brought out the cushions and rugs and many other things, and when all were arranged, master came down the steps carrying the mistress in his arms, placed her carefully in the carriage while the house servants stood round crying. Goodbye again, he said. We shall not forget any of you and he got in. Drive on, John. Joe jumped up, and we trotted slowly through the park and through the village, where the people were standing at their doors to have a last look and to say, God bless them. When we reached the railway station, I think the mistress walked from the carriage to the waiting room. I heard her say in her own sweet voice, Goodbye, John. God bless you. I felt the rain twitch. But John made no answer. Perhaps he could not speak. The next morning after breakfast, Joe put Merrylegs into the mistress's low chaise to take him to the vicarage. He came first and said goodbye to us, and Merrylegs neighed to us from the yard. Then John put the saddle on Ginger and the leading rein on me, and rode us across the country about fifteen miles to Earlshall Park, where the Earl of Wendover lived. There was a very fine house and a great deal of stabling. We went into the yard and through a stone gateway. We were taken to a light, airy stable and placed in boxes adjoining each other where we were rubbed down and fed. In about half an hour, John and Mr. York, who was to be our new coachman, came in to see us. John said, I had better mention that we have never used the bearing rein with either of them. The black horse never had one on and the dealer said it was the gag bit that spoiled the other's temper. Well, said York, if they come here, they must wear the bearing rein. I prefer a loose rein myself, and his lordship is always very reasonable about horses. But, my lady, there's another thing. She will have style, and if her carriage horses are not reined up tight, she won't look at them. I am sorry for it, very sorry, said John. But I must go now, I shall lose the train. He came round to each of us to pat and speak to us for the last time. His voice sounded very sad. I held my face close to him. That was all I could do to say goodbye. And then he was gone. And I have never seen him since. In the afternoon, we were harnessed and put in the carriage. And as the stable clock struck three, we were led round to the front of the house. It was all very grand and three or four times as large as the old house at Birtwick, but not half so pleasant, if a horse may have an opinion. Presently we heard the rustling sound of silk as my lady came down the flight of stone steps. In an imperious voice, she said, York, you must put those horses' heads higher. They are not fit to be seen. York got down and said very respectfully, I beg your pardon, my lady, but these horses have not been reined up for three years, and my lord said it would be safer to bring them to it by degrees. But if your ladyship pleases, I can take them up a little more. Do so, she said. York came round to our heads and shortened the rein himself. One hole, I think. Every little makes a difference, be it for better or worse. And that day we had a steep hill to go up. Then I began to understand what I had heard of. 
Of course, I wanted to put my head forward and take the carriage up with a will, as we had been used to do. But no, I had to pull with my head up now, and that took all the spirit out of me, and the strain came on my back and legs. When we came in, Ginger said, Now you see what it is like, but this is not bad. And if it does not get much worse than this, I shall say nothing about it, for we are very well treated here. But if they strain me up tight, why, let them look out. I can't bear it and I won't. Day by day, hole by hole, our bearing reins were shortened. And instead of looking forward with pleasure to having my harness put on as I used to do, I began to dread it. Ginger too seemed restless, though she said very little. At last I thought the worst was over. For several days there was no more shortening, and I determined to make the best of it and do my duty, though it was now a constant harass instead of pleasure. But the worst was yet to come. One day my lady came down later than usual, and the silk rustled more than ever. Drive to the Duchess of Buckingham's, she said, and then after a pause, are you never going to get those horses' heads up, York? Raise them at once. York came to me first, whilst the groom stood at Ginger's head. He drew my head back and fixed the rein so tight that it was almost intolerable. Then he went to Ginger, who was impatiently jerking her head up and down against the bit, as was her way now. She had a good idea of what was coming, and the moment York took the rein off the terret in order to shorten it, she took her opportunity and reared up so suddenly that York had his nose roughly hit and his hat knocked off, and the groom was nearly thrown off his legs. At once they both flew to her head, but she was a match for them, and went on plunging, rearing and kicking in a most desperate manner. At last she kicked right over the carriage pole and fell down, after giving me a severe blow on my near quarter. There is no knowing what further mischief she might have done, had not York promptly sat himself down flat on her head to prevent her struggling, at the same time calling out, Unbuckle the black horse, run for the winch, and unscrew the carriage pole. Cut the trace here, somebody, if you can't unhitch it. One of the footmen ran for the winch, and another brought a knife from the house. The groom soon set me free from Ginger and the carriage, and led me to my box. York felt me all over and soon found the place above my hock where I had been kicked. It was swollen and painful. He ordered it to be sponged with hot water and then some lotion put on. Lord Wendover was much put out when he learned what had happened. He blamed York for giving way to his mistress, to which he replied that in future he would much prefer to receive his orders only from his lordship. But I think nothing came of it, for things went on the same as before. Ginger was never put into the carriage again, but as for me, I was obliged still to go in the carriage and had a fresh partner called Max. What I suffered with that rain for four long months in my lady's carriage, it would be hard to describe. York might have known, and very likely did know, how that rain harassed me, but I suppose he took it as a matter of course that could not be helped. At any rate, nothing was done to relieve me. Early in the spring, Lord Wendover and part of his family went up to London and took York with them. I and Ginger and some other horses were left at home for use, and the head groom was left in charge. The Lady Harriet, who remained at the hall, was a great invalid and never went out in the carriage, and the Lady Anne preferred riding on horseback with her brother or cousins. She was a perfect horsewoman, and as gay and gentle as she was beautiful. She chose me for her horse, and named me Black Auster. There was a gentleman of the name of Blantyre staying at the hall. He always rode a bay mare called Lizzie, and praised her so much that one day Lady Anne ordered the side saddle to be put on her, and the other saddle on me. When we came to the door, the gentleman seemed very uneasy. How's this? he said. Are you tired of your good Black Auster? Oh, no, not at all, she replied, but I'm amiable enough to let you ride him for once, and I will try your charming Lizzie. There was no more to be said. He placed her carefully on the saddle. Just as we were moving off, 
a footman came out with a slip of paper and a message from the Lady Harriet. Would they ask this question for her at Dr. Ashley's and bring the answer? The village was about a mile off, and the doctor's house was the last in it. Blantyre alighted at the gate and was going to open it for Lady Anne, but she said, I will wait for you here and you can hang Auster's rein on the gate. He looked at her doubtfully. And I will not be five minutes, he said. Oh, do not hurry yourself. Lizzie and I shall not run away from you. He hung my rein on one of the iron spikes and was soon hidden amongst the trees. There was a meadow on the opposite side of the road, the gate of which stood open. Just then, some cart horses and several young colts came trotting out in a very disorderly manner, whilst a boy behind was cracking a great whip. The colts were wild and frolicsome, and one of them bolted across the road and blundered up against Lizzie's hind legs. And whether it was the stupid colt or the loud cracking of the whip or both together, I cannot say. But she gave a violent kick and dashed off into a headlong gallop. It was so sudden that Lady Anne was nearly unseated. But she soon recovered herself. I gave a loud, shrill neigh for help. Again and again I neighed, pawing the ground impatiently and tossing my head to get the rein loose. I had not long to wait. Blantyre came running to the gate. He looked anxiously about and just caught sight of the flying figure, now far away on the road. In an instant, he sprang into the saddle. I needed no whip or spur, for I was as eager as my rider. He saw it, and giving me free rein, and leaning a little forward, we dashed after them. We'd hardly turned on the common when we caught sight of my lady, her long brown hair streaming behind her. Her head and body were thrown back as if she were pulling with all her remaining strength. About halfway across the heath, there'd been a wide dyke recently cut, and the earth from the cutting was cast up roughly on the other side. Surely this would stop them. But no. With scarcely a pause, Lizzie took the leap, stumbled among the rough clods, and fell. Blantyre groaned. Now, Auster, do your best. He gave me a steady rein. I gathered myself well together, and with one determined leap, cleared both dyke and bank. Motionless among the heather, with her face to the earth, lay my poor young mistress. Blantyre kneeled down and called her name. There was no sound. Gently he turned her face upward. It was ghastly white, and the eyes were closed. At no great distance there were two men cutting turf, who, seeing Lizzie running wild without a rider, had left their work to catch her. Blantyre's halloo soon brought them to the spot, the former's man seemed much troubled at the sight and asked what he could do. Can you ride? Well, sir, I beat much of oarsman, but I risked my neck for the Lady Anne. She was uncommon good to my wife in the winter. Then mount this horse, my friend. Your neck will be quite safe. And ride to the doctor's and ask him to come instantly. Then on to the hall. Tell them all that you know and bid them send me the carriage with Lady Anne's maid and help. I shall stay here. All right, sir, I'll do my best. He then somehow scrambled into the saddle, and with a gee up and a clap on my sides with both his legs, he started on his journey. There was a great deal of hurry and excitement after the news became known. I was just turned into my box. The saddle and bridle were taken off and a cloth thrown over me. Ginger was saddled and sent off in great haste for Lord George, and soon I heard the carriage roll out of the yard. It seemed a long time before Ginger came back and before we were left alone, and then she told me all that she had seen. I can't tell much, she said. We went a gallop nearly all the way and got there just as the doctor rode up. There was a woman sitting on the ground with a lady's head in her lap. The doctor poured something into her mouth, but all that I heard was, she is not dead. Two days after the accident, Blantyre paid me a visit. He patted me and praised me very much. He told Lord George that he was sure the horse knew of Annie's danger as well as he did. I could not have held him in if I would, said he. She ought never to ride any other horse. I found by their conversation that my young mistress was now out of danger and would soon be able to ride again. This was good news for me, and I looked forward to a happy life. I must now say a little about Reuben Smith, 
who was left in charge of the stables when York went to London. No one more thoroughly understood his business than he did, and when he was all right, there could be no more faithful or valuable man. But he had one great fault, and that was the love of drink. It was now early in April, and the family was expected home sometime in May. The light brown was to be fresh done up, and as Colonel Blantyre was obliged to return to his regiment, it was arranged that Smith should drive him to the town in it and ride back. For this purpose he took the saddle with him, and I was chosen for the journey. At the station, the Colonel put some money into Smith's hand and bid him goodbye, saying, Take care of your young mistress, Reuben, and don't let Black Horse to be hacked about by any random young prig that wants to ride him. Keep him for the lady. We left the carriage at the maker's, and Smith rode me to the White Lion, and ordered the ostler to feed me well and have me ready for him at four o'clock. A nail in one of my front shoes had started as I came along, but the ostler did not notice it till just about four o'clock. Smith didn't come into the yard till five, and then he said he wouldn't leave till six as he'd met with some old friends. The man then told him of the nail and asked if he should have the shoe looked to. No, said Smith, that will be all right till we get home. He spoke in a very loud, off-hand way, and I thought it very unlike him. The landlord stood at the door and said, Have a care, Mr. Smith. But he answered angrily with an oath. And almost before he was out of the town, he began to gallop, frequently giving me a sharp cut with his whip, though I was going at full speed. With one shoe gone, I was forced to gallop at my utmost speed. Of course, my shoeless foot suffered dreadfully. The hoof was broken and split down to the very quick, and the inside was terribly cut by the sharpness of the stones. This could not go on. No horse could keep his footing under such circumstances. The pain was too great. I stumbled and fell with violence on both my knees. Smith was flung off by my fall, and owing to the speed I was going at, he must have fallen with great force. I soon recovered my feet and limped to the side of the road, where it was free from stones. The moon had just risen above the hedge, and by its light I could see Smith lying a few yards beyond me. It must have been nearly midnight when I heard at a great distance the sound of horses' feet. I was almost sure I could distinguish Ginger's step. A little nearer still, and I could tell she was in the dog cart. I neighed loudly, and was overjoyed to hear an answering neigh from Ginger and men's voices. They came slowly over the stones, and stopped at the dark figure that lay upon the ground. One of the men jumped out and stooped down over it. It is Reuben, he said, and he does not stir. The other man followed and bent over him. He is dead, he said. Feel how cold his hands are. They raised him up but there was no life, and his hair was soaked with blood. They laid him down again, and came and looked at me. They soon saw my cut knees. Why, the horse has been down and thrown him. Who would have thought the black horse would have done that? Nobody thought he could fall. Reuben must have been lying here for hours. Odd, too, that the horse has not moved from the place. I made a step, but almost fell again. Hello, he's bad in his foot as well as his knees. Look here, his hoof is all cut to pieces. He might well come down, poor fellow. Just think of it, riding a horse over these stones without a shoe. Finally, one of them started off very slowly with his sad load, and the other came and looked at my foot again. Then he took his handkerchief and bound it closely round, and so he led me home. The next day, after the farrier had examined my wounds, he said he hoped the joint was not injured, and if so, I should not be spoiled for work, but I should never lose the blemish. I believe they did the best to make a good cure, but it was a long and painful one. As soon as my knees were sufficiently healed, I was turned into a small meadow for a month or two. No other creature was there, and though I enjoyed the liberty and the sweet grass, Yet I had been so long used to society that I felt lonely. Ginger and I had become fast friends, and now I missed her company extremely. 
I often laid when I heard horses' feet passing in the road, but I seldom got an answer. Till one morning the gate was opened, and who should come in but dear old Ginger. The man slipped off her halter and left her there. With a joyful whinny I trotted up to her. We were both glad to meet, but I soon found that it was not for our pleasure that she was brought to be with me. Her story would be too long to tell, but the end of it was that she'd been ruined by hard riding and was now turned off to see what rest would do. One day we saw the Earl come into the meadow, and York was with him. Seeing who it was, we stood still under our lime tree and let them come up to us. They examined us carefully. The Earl seemed much annoyed. There is three hundred pounds flung away for no earthly use, said he. But what I care most for is that these horses of my old friend, who thought they would find a good home with me, are ruined. The mare shall have a twelve months run, and we shall see what that will do for her. But the black one, he must be sold. Tis a great pity, but I could not have knees like these in my stables. Through the recommendation of York, I was bought by the master of a livery stable. I had to go by train, which was new to me and required a good deal of courage the first time. But as I found the puffing, rushing, whistling, and more than all the trembling of the horse box in which I stood did me no real harm, I soon took it quietly. My new master kept a good many horses and carriages of different kinds for hire. Sometimes his own men drove them, at others the horse and chaise were let to gentlemen or ladies who drove themselves. Hitherto I had always been driven by people who at least knew how to drive, but in this place I was to get my experience of all the different kinds of bad and ignorant driving to which we horses are subjected. For I was a job horse, and was let out to all sorts of people who wished to hire me. And as I was good-tempered and gentle, I think I was oftener let out to the ignorant drivers than some of the other horses because I could be depended upon. It would take a long time to tell of all the different styles in which I was driven, but I will mention a few of them. First, there were the tight rein drivers, men who seemed to think that all depended on holding the reins as hard as they could, never relaxing the pull on the horse's mouth or giving him the liberty of movement. Then there is the steam engine style of driving. These drivers were mostly people from the towns, who never had a horse of their own and generally travelled by rail. They always seemed to think that a horse was something like a steam engine, only smaller. At any rate, they think that if only they pay for it, a horse is bound to go just as far and just as fast, and with just as heavy a load as they please. Of course, we sometimes came in for good driving here. I remember one morning I was put into the light gig and taken to a house in Pulteney Street. Two gentlemen came out. The taller of them came round to my head. He looked at the bit and bridle, and just shifted the collar with his hand to see if it fitted comfortably. Do you consider this horse wants a curb? he said to the ossa. Well, said the man, I should say uh, it would go just as well without. He has an uncommon good mouth, and though he has a fine spirit, he has no vice. But we generally find people like the curb. I don't like it, said the gentleman. Be so good as to take it off and put the rein in at the cheek. An easy mouth is a great thing on a long journey, is it not, old fellow, he said, patting my neck. This gentleman took a great liking to me, and after trying me several times with a saddle, he prevailed upon my master to sell me to a friend of his, who wanted a safe, pleasant horse for riding. And so it came to pass that in the summer I was sold to Mr. Barry. My new master was an unmarried man. He lived at Bath and was much engaged in business. His doctor advised him to take horse exercise, and for this purpose he bought me. He hired a stable a short distance from his lodgings, and in a few days my new groom came. He was a tall, good-looking fellow enough, but if ever there was a humbug in the shape of a groom, Alfred Smirk was the man. He was very civil to me and never used me ill, but as to cleaning my feet or looking to my shoes or grooming me thoroughly, he thought no more of that than if I'd been a cow. He left my bit rusty, my saddle damp, and my crupper stiff. Of course it was a great thing not to be ill-used, but then a horse wants more than that. 
I had a loose box and might have been very comfortable if Smirk had not been too indolent to clean it out. He never took all the straw away, and the smell from what lay underneath was very bad. The strong vapours that rose up made my eyes smart and inflame, and I did not feel the same appetite for my food. I don't know what is the matter with this horse. He goes very fumble-footed. I am sometimes afraid he will stumble. Yes, sir, said Alfred. I have noticed the same myself when I have exercised him. Now the fact was that he hardly ever did exercise me. And when the master was busy, I often stood for days together without stretching my legs at all, and yet being fed just as high as if I were at hard work. This often disordered my health and made me sometimes heavy and dull, but more often restless and feverish. One day my feet were so tender that trotting over some fresh stones with my master on my back, I made two such serious stumbles that as he came down Lansdowne into the city, he stopped at the farrier's and asked him to see what was the matter with me. The man took up my feet one by one and examined them. Then, standing up and dusting his hands one against the other, he said, Your horse has got the thrush, and badly too. His feet are very tender. It is fortunate that he has not been down. I wonder your groom has not seen to it before. This is the sort of thing we find in foul stables where the litter is never properly cleared out. If you will send him here tomorrow, I will attend to the hoof, and I will direct your man how to apply the liniment which I will give him. The next day I had my feet thoroughly cleansed and stuffed with tow, soaked in some strong lotion, and a very unpleasant business it was. The farrier ordered all the litter to be taken out of my box day by day, and the floor kept very clean. Then I was to have bran mashes, a little green meat, and not so much corn, till my feet were well again. With this treatment I soon regained my spirits, but Mr. Barry was so much disgusted at having been deceived by his groom that he determined to give up keeping a horse and to hire when he wanted one. I was therefore kept till my feet were quite sound and was then sold again. No doubt a horse fair is a very amusing place to those who have nothing to lose. At any rate, there is plenty to see. Long strings of young horses out of the country, fresh from the marshes, and droves of shaggy little Welsh ponies no higher than merry legs, and hundreds of cart horses of all sorts, some of them with their long tails braided up and tied with scarlet cord, and a good many, like myself, handsome and high-bred, but fallen into the middle class through some accident or blemish, unsoundness of wind or some other complaint. There was one man, I thought, if he would buy me, I should be happy. He was not a gentleman, nor yet one of the loud, flashy sort that call themselves so. He was rather a small man, but well-made and quick in all his motions. I knew in a moment by the way he handled me that he was used to horses. He spoke gently, and his grey eye had a kindly, cheery look in it. Well, old chap, he said, I think we should suit each other. I'll give twenty-four for him. The money was paid on the spot, and half an hour after we were on our way to London, through pleasant lanes and country roads, until we came into the great London thoroughfare on which we travelled steadily, till in the twilight we reached the great city. My owner pulled up at one of the houses and whistled. The door flew open and a young woman, followed by a little girl and boy, ran out. There was a very lively greeting as my rider dismounted. Now then, Harry, my boy, open the gates and Mother will bring us the lantern. The next minute they were all standing round me in a small stable yard. Is he gentle, Father? Yes, Dolly, as gentle as your kitten. Come on, pat him. At once the little hand was patting about all over my shoulder without fear. How good it felt. Let me get him a bran mash while you rub him down, said the mother. I was led into a comfortable, clean-smelling stall with plenty of dry straw. And after a capital supper, I lay down, thinking I was going to be happy. My new master's name was Jeremiah Barker. But as everyone called him Jerry, I shall do the same. Polly, his wife was just as good a match as a man could have. She was a plump, trim, tidy little woman 
with smooth, dark hair, dark eyes, and a merry little mouth. The boy was nearly 12 years old, a tall, frank, good-tempered lad, and little Dorothy. Dolly, they called her, was her mother all over again at eight years old. They were all wonderfully fond of each other. I never knew such a happy, merry family before or since. Jerry had a cab of his own and two horses, which he drove and attended to himself. His other horse was a tall, white, rather large boned animal called Captain. Captain had been broken in and trained for an army horse. His first owner was an officer of cavalry going out to the Crimean War. He said he quite enjoyed the training with all the other horses, but when he came to being sent abroad over the sea in a great ship, he almost changed his mind. Phew, that part of it, said he, was dreadful. But what about the fighting, said I? Was not that worse than anything else? Well, said he, I hardly know. We always liked to hear the trumpet sound and to be called out, and were impatient to start off, though sometimes we had to stand for hours waiting for the word of command. And when the word was given, we used to spring forward as gaily and eagerly as if there were no cannonballs, bayonets, or bullets, until one dreadful day I had never felt terror. That day I shall never forget. Here old Captain paused for a while and drew a long breath. I waited, and he went on. It was one autumn morning, and as usual, an hour before daybreak, our cavalry had turned out. My dear master and I were at the head of the line. He stroked my neck that morning, more, I think, than he had ever done before, quietly, on and on, as if he were thinking of something else. I cannot tell all that happened on that day but I will tell of the last charge that we made together. It was across a valley, right in front of the enemy's cannon. My master, my dear master, was cheering on his comrades with his right arm raised on high, when one of the balls whizzing close to my head struck him. He fell to the earth. The other riders swept past us, and by the force of their charge I was driven from the spot where he fell. I wanted to keep my place by his side and not leave him under that rush of horses' feet, but it was in vain, and now without a master or a friend I was alone on that great slaughter ground. Then fear took hold on me, and I trembled as I had never trembled before. Some of the horses had been so badly wounded that they could scarcely move from the loss of blood. Other noble creatures were trying on three legs to drag themselves along. Their groans were piteous to hear. After the battle, the wounded men were brought in and the dead were buried. And what about the wounded horses, I said? Were they left to die? No, the army farriers went over the field with their pistols and shot all that were ruined. In our stables, there was only about one in four that returned. I never saw my dear master again. I believe he fell dead from the saddle. I never loved any other master so well. I went into many other engagements, but was only wounded once, and then not seriously, and when the war was over I came back to England, as sound and strong as I went out. I said, I have heard people talk about war as if it was a very fine thing. Ha, said he, I should think they never saw it. No doubt it is very fine when there is no enemy, when it is just exercise and parade and sham fight. Yes, it is very fine then. But when thousands of good brave men and horses are killed or crippled for life, it has a very different look. Do you know what they fought about? said I. No, said he. That is more than a horse can understand. But the enemy must have been awfully wicked people if it was right to go all that way over the sea on purpose to kill them. I never knew a better man than my new master. He was kind and good and strong for the right and so good-tempered and merry that very few people could pick a quarrel with him. I should say that for a cab horse I was very well off indeed. My driver was my owner, and it was his interest to treat me well and not overwork, even had he not been so good a man as he was. But there were a great many horses which belonged to the large cab owners, who let them out to their drivers for so much money a day. As the horses did not belong to these men, the only thing they thought of was how to get their money out of them, first to pay the master, 
and then to provide for their own living. And a dreadful time some of these horses had of it. Of course, I understood but little, but it was often talked over on the stand. And the governor, who was a kind-hearted man and fond of horses, would sometimes speak up if one came in very much jaded or ill-used. One day, a shabby, miserable-looking driver, who went by the name of C.D. Sam, brought in his horse looking dreadfully beat. And the governor said, You and your horse look more fit for the police station than for the rank. The man flung his tattered rug over the horse, turned full round upon the governor, and said in a voice that sounded almost desperate, If the police have any business with the matter, it ought to be with the masters who charge us so much, or with affairs that are fixed so low. If a man has to pay 18 shillings a day for the use of a cab and two horses, as many of us have to do in the season, and must make that up before we earn a penny for ourselves, I say, tis more than hard work. Nine shillings a day to get out of each horse before you begin to get your own living. You know that's true. And if the horses don't work, we must starve. And I and my children have known what that is before now. The men who stood round much approved of this speech. And one of them said, Yeah, it is desperate hard. And if a man sometimes does what is wrong, it is no wonder. And if he gets a dram too much, who's to blow him up? Jerry had taken no part in this conversation, but I never saw his face look so sad before. The governor had stood with both hands in his pockets, and now he took his handkerchief out of his hat and wiped his forehead. You have beaten me, Sam, he said, for it's all true, and I won't cast it up to you any more about the police. It was the look in that horse's eye that came over me. A few mornings after this talk, a new man came on the stand with Sam's cab. Hello! said one. What's up with seedy Sam? He's ill in bed, said the man. He was taken last night in the yard and could scarcely crawl home. His wife sent a boy this morning to say his father was in an eye fever and could not get out, so I'm here instead. The next morning the same man came again. How is Sam? inquired the governor. He's gone, said the man. What? Gone? Don't mean to say he's dead. Just snaffed out said the other. He died at four o'clock this morning. All yesterday he was raving. I never had a Sunday's rest. These were his last words. No one spoke for a while. And then the governor said, I tell you what, mates, this is a warning for us. One day, whilst our cab and many others were waiting outside one of the parks where a band was playing, a shabby old cab drove up beside ours. The horse was an old worn-out chestnut with an ill-kept coat and bones that showed plainly through it. There was a hopeless look in the dull eye that I couldn't help noticing. And then, as I was thinking where I had seen that horse before, she looked full at me and said, Black Beauty, is that you? It was Ginger. But how changed! The beautifully arched and glossy neck was now straight and lank and fallen in. The clean, straight legs and delicate fetlocks were swelled. The joints were grown out of shape with hard work. The face that was once so full of spirit and life was now full of suffering. And I could tell by her heaving sides and her frequent cough how bad her breath was. Our drivers were standing together a little way off, so I sidled up to her a step or two that we might have a little quiet talk. It was a sad tale that she had to tell. After a twelve months run-off at Earl's Hall, she was considered to be fit for work again, and was sold to a gentleman. For a little while she got on very well, but after a longer gallop than usual, the old strain returned, and after being rested and doctored, she was again sold. In this way she changed hands several times, but always getting lower down. So at last, she said, I was bought by a man who keeps a number of cabs and horses and lets them out. You look well off, and I'm glad of it. But I couldn't tell you what my life has been. I said, you used to stand up for yourself if you were ill-used. Ah, she said, I did once, but it's no use. Men are strongest, and if they are cruel and have no feeling, there is nothing that we can do but just bear it. Bear it on and on to the end. I wish the end was come.
I wish I was dead. I have seen dead horses, and I am sure they do not suffer pain. I was very much troubled and put my nose up to hers, but I could say nothing to comfort her. I think she was pleased to see me, for she said, You are the only friend I ever had. Just then her driver came up, and with a tug at her mouth, backed her out of the line and drove off, leaving me very sad indeed. A short time after this, a cart with a dead horse in it passed our cab stand. The head hung out of the cart tail, the lifeless tongue was slowly dropping with blood, and the sunken eyes, but I can't speak of them, the sight was too dreadful. It was a chestnut horse with a long, thin neck. I saw a white streak down the forehead. I believe it was Ginger. I hoped it was, for then her troubles would be over. Oh, if men were more merciful, they would shoot us before we came to such misery. As we came into the yard one afternoon, Polly came out. Jerry, I've had Mr. Baker here asking about your vote, and he wants to hire your cab for the election. He will call for an answer. Well, Polly, you may say that my cab will be otherwise engaged. I should not like to have it pasted over with their great bills, and as to make Jack and Captain race about to the public houses and bring up half drunken voters, why, I think it would be an insult to the horses. No, I shan't do it. At last came the election day. There was no lack of work for Jerry and me. First came a stout, puffy gentleman with a carpet bag. He wanted to go to Bishopsgate Station. Then we were called by a party who wished to be taken to Regent's Park. And next we were wanted in a side street where a timid, anxious old lady was waiting to be taken to the bank. There we had to stop to take her back again. And just as we had set her down, a red-faced gentleman with a handful of papers came running up out of breath. And before Jerry could get down, he'd opened the door, popped himself in, and called out, Bow Street Police Station, quick! So off we went with him. And when, after another turn or two, we came back, there was no other cab on the stand. Jerry put on my nose bag, for, as he said, we must eat when we can these days, so munch away and make the best of your time, old boy. I had not eaten many mouthfuls, before a poor young woman carrying a heavy child came along the street. She was looking this way and that way and seemed quite bewildered. Presently she made her way up to Jerry and asked if he could tell her the way to St. Thomas's Hospital and how far it was to get there. She had come from the country that morning, she said, in a market cart. She did not know about the election and was quite a stranger in London. She got an order for the hospital for her little boy. The child was crying with a feeble, pining cry. Poor little fellow, she said. He suffers a deal of pain. He's four years old and he can't walk any more than a baby. But the doctor said if he could get him into the hospital, he might get well. Pray, sir, how far is it and which way is it? Why, missus, said Jerry, you can't get there walking through crowds like this. Why, it's three miles away and that child is heavy. Look you here, said Jerry. I've got a wife and dear children at home and I know a father's feelings. Now get you into that cab, and I'll take you there for nothing. I'll be ashamed of myself to let a woman and a sick child run a risk like that. Oh, heaven bless you, said the woman, and burst into tears. There, there, cheer up, my dear. I'll soon take you there. Come, let me put you inside. We were soon on our way to hospital, going as much as possible through by streets. Jerry rang the great bell and helped the young woman out. Oh, thank you a thousand times, she said. I could never have got here alone. You're kindly welcome, and I hope the dear child will be soon better. He watched her go in at the door, and gently he said to himself, Inasmuch as he have done it to one of the least of these. Then he patted my neck, which was always his way when anything pleased him. Captain and I were very great friends. He was a noble old fellow, and he was very good company. I never thought that he would have to leave his home and go down the hill. But his turn came, and this is how it happened. I wasn't there, but I heard all about it. He and Jerry had taken a party to the great railway station over London Bridge and were coming back, somewhere between the bridge and the monument, when Jerry saw a brewer's empty dray coming along, drawn by two powerful horses. 
The drayman was lashing his horses with his heavy whip. The dray was light, and they started off at a furious rate. The man had no control over them, and the street was full of traffic. One young girl was knocked down and run over, and the next moment they dashed up against our cab. Both wheels were torn off, and the cab was thrown over. The captain was dragged down. The shaft splintered, and one of them ran into his side. Jerry, too, was thrown, but only bruised. Nobody could tell how he escaped. He always said it was a miracle. But when poor Captain was got up, he was found to be very much cut and knocked about. Jerry led him home gently, and a sad sight it was to see the blood soaking into his white coat and dropping from his side and shoulder. The drayman was proved to be very drunk and was fined, and the brewer had to pay damages to our master, but there was no one to pay damages to poor Captain. The farrier and Jerry did the best they could to ease his pain and make him comfortable. The fly had to be mended, and for several days I did not go out, and Jerry earned nothing. The first time we went to the stand after the accident, the governor came up to hear how Captain was. He'll never get over it, said Jerry. At least not for my work, so the farrier said this morning. He says he may do for carting and that sort of work. It has put me out very much. Carting, indeed. Carting? I've seen what horses come to at that work round London. I only wish all the drunkards could be put in a lunatic asylum instead of being allowed to run foul of sober people. If there's one devil that I should like to see in the bottomless pit more than another, it's the devil drink. The farrier said Captain might mend up enough to sell for a few pounds, but Jerry said no. A few pounds got by selling a good old servant into hard work and misery would canker all the rest of his money. And he thought the kindest thing he could do for the fine old fellow would be to put a sure bullet through his heart, and then he would never suffer more. For he did not know where to find a kind master for the rest of his days. The day after this was decided, Harry took me to the forge for some new shoes. When I returned, Captain was gone. I and the family all felt it very much. Jerry had now to look out for another horse, and he soon heard of one through an acquaintance who was under groom in a nobleman's stables. The next day, Hotspur, that was his name, came home. He was a fine brown horse without a white hair on him, as tall as Captain, with a very handsome head and only five years old. Hotspur thought it a great come down to be a cab horse and was disgusted at standing in the rank. But he confessed to me at the end of the week that an easy mouth and a free hand made up for a great deal, and after all, the work was not so degrading as having one's head and tail fastened to each other at the saddle. In fact, he settled in well, and Jerry liked him very much. I saw a great deal of trouble amongst the horses in London, and much of it might have been prevented by a little common sense. We horses do not mind hard work if we are treated reasonably, and I am sure there are many driven by quite poor men who have a happier life than I had when I used to go in the counties of Wendover's carriage with my silver-mounted harness and high feeding. It often went to my heart to see how the little ponies were used, straining along with heavy loads or staggering under heavy blows from some low, cruel boy. Once I saw a little grey pony with a thick mane and a pretty head, and so much like Merrylegs, that if I had not been in harness, I should have neighed to him. He was doing his best to pull a heavy cart, while a strong, rough boy was cutting him under the belly with his whip, and chucking cruelly at his little mouth. Could it be Merrylegs? It was just like him. But then Mr. Bloomfield was never to sell him, and I think he would not do it. But this might have been quite as good a little fellow, and had as happy a place when he was young. Christmas and the New Year are very merry times for some people, but for cabmen and cabmen's horses, it's no holiday, though it may be a harvest. There are so many parties, balls, and places of amusement open that the work is hard and often late. On the evening of the New Year, we had to take two gentlemen to a house in one of the West End squares. We set them down at nine o'clock and were told to come back at eleven. But, said one of them, 
As it is a card party, you may have to wait a few minutes, but don't be late. As the clock struck eleven, we were at the door, for Jerry was always punctual. The clock chimed the quarters. One, two, three, and then struck twelve. But the door did not open. The wind had been very changeable, with squalls of rain during the day, but now it came on sharp, driving sleet, which seemed to come all the way round. It was very cold, and there was no shelter. Jerry got off his box and came and pulled one of my cloths a little more over my neck. Then he took a turn or two up and down, stamping his feet. Then he began to beat his arms, but that set him off coughing. So he opened the cab door and sat at the bottom, his feet on the pavement, and was a little sheltered. Still the clock chimed the quarters, and no one came. At half past twelve, he rang the bell and asked the servant if he would be wanted that night. Oh, yes, you'll be wanted safe enough, said the man. You must not go, it will soon be over. And again Jerry sat down, but his voice was so hoarse I could hardly hear him. At a quarter past one, the door opened, and the two gentlemen came out. They got into the cab without a word, and told Jerry where to drive. That was nearly two miles. My legs were numb with cold, and I thought I should have stumbled. When the men got out, they never said they were sorry to have kept us waiting so long, but were angry at the charge. However, as Jerry never charged more than was his due, so he never took less, and they had to pay for the two hours and a quarter waiting. But it was hard-earned money to Jerry. At last we got home. He could hardly speak, and his cough was dreadful. Polly asked no questions, but opened the door and held the lantern for him. Can't I do something? she said. Yeah, get Jack something warm and, and then boil me some gruel. This was said in a hoarse whisper. He could hardly get his breath. But he gave me a rub down as usual and even went up into the hayloft for an extra bundle of straw for my bed. Polly brought me a warm mash that made me comfortable and then they locked the door. It was late the next morning before anyone came and then it was only Harry. He cleaned us and fed us and swept out the stalls then he put the straw back again as if it was Sunday. He was very still, and neither whistled nor sang. At noon he came again and gave us our food and water. This time Dolly came with him. She was crying. And I could gather from what they said that Jerry was dangerously ill, and the doctor said it was a bad case. So two days passed, and there was great trouble indoors. We only saw Harry, and sometimes Dolly. I think she came for company, for Polly was always with Jerry and he had to be kept very quiet. On the third day, whilst Harry was in the stable, a tap came at the door and Governor Grant came in. I wouldn't go to the house, my boy, he said, but I want to know how your father is. He's very bad, said Harry. He can't be much worse. They call it bronchitis. The doctor thinks it will turn one way or another tonight. Oh, that's bad, very bad, said Grant, shaking his head. I know two men who died of that last week. It takes them off in no time. But whilst there's life, there's hope, so you must keep up your spirits. If there's any rule that good men should get over these things, I'm sure he will, my boy. He's the best man I know. I'll look in early tomorrow. Early next morning he was there. Well, he said, father is better, said Harry. Mother hopes he will get over it. Thank God, said the governor. Jerry grew better steadily. But the doctor said that he must never go back to the cab work again if he wished to be an old man. The children had many consultations about what father and mother would do and how they could help to earn money. One afternoon, Dolly came in looking very full of something. Who lives at Fairstow, Harry? Mother has got a letter from Fairstow. She seems so glad and ran upstairs to father with it. Don't you know? Why, it's the name of Mrs. Fowler's place, mother's old mistress. Oh, Mrs. Fowler. Of course I know all about her. I wonder what she's writing to mother about. Mother wrote to her last week, said Harry. You know, she told father if ever he gave up the cab work, she would like to know. I wonder what she says. Run in and see, Dolly. In a few minutes, Dolly came dancing into the stable. Oh, Harry, 
There never was anything so beautiful. Mrs. Fowler says we are all to go and live near her. There is a cottage now empty that will just suit us with a garden and an hen house and apple trees and everything. And her coachman is going away in the spring and then she will want father in his place. And there are good families round where you can get a place in the garden or the stable or as a page boy. And there's a good school for me and... Oh, mother is laughing and crying by turns and father does look so happy. It was quickly settled that as soon as Jerry was well enough, they should remove to the country and that the cab and horses should be sold as soon as possible. This was heavy news for me, for I was not young now and could not look for any improvement in my condition. Since I left Birtwick, I had never been so happy as with my dear master Jerry. But three years of cab work, even under the best conditions, will tell on one's strength. And I felt that I was not the horse that I had been. The day came for going away. Jerry had not been allowed to go out yet, and I never saw him after that New Year's Eve. Polly and the children came to bid me goodbye. Harry stroked me a great deal, but said nothing, only he seemed very sad. And so I was led away to my new place. I shall never forget my new master. He had black eyes and a hooked nose. His mouth was as full of teeth as a bulldog's, and his voice was as harsh as the grinding of cartwheels over gravel stones. He was a cab owner named Nicholas Skinner. I have heard men say that seeing is believing, but I should say that feeling is believing. For much as I had seen before, I never knew till now the utter misery of a cab horse's life. Skinner had a low set of cabs and a low set of drivers. He was hard on the men and the men were hard on the horses. My driver had a cruel whip with something so sharp at the end that it sometimes drew blood and he would even whip me under the belly and flip the lash out at my head. Indignities like these took the heart out of me terribly but I still did my best and never hung back, for, as poor Ginger said, it was no use. Men are the strongest. My life was now so utterly wretched that I wished I might, like Ginger, drop down dead at my work and be out of my misery. And one day, my wish very nearly came to pass. I went on the stand at eight in the morning and had done a good share of work when we had just to take a fare to the railway. A long train was expected in, so my driver pulled up at the back of some of the outside cabs to take the chance of a return fare. It was a very heavy train, and as all the cabs were soon engaged, ours was called for. There was a party of four, a noisy, blustering man with a lady, a little boy, and a young girl, and a great deal of luggage. The lady and the boy got into the cab, and while the man ordered about the luggage, the young girl came and looked at me. Papa, she said. I'm sure this poor horse cannot take us and all our luggage so far. He's so very weak and worn out. Do look at him. Ah, he's all right, miss, said my driver. He's strong enough. The porter, who was pulling about some heavy boxes, suggested to the gentleman, as there was so much baggage, whether he would not take a second cab. Can your horse do it or can't he? said the blustering man. Oh, he can do it all right, sir. Send up the boxes, porter. He can take more than that. He helped to haul up a box so heavy that I could feel the springs go down. Papa, Papa, do take a second cab, said the young girl in a beseeching tone. I'm sure we are wrong. I'm sure it is very cruel. Nonsense, Grace. Get in at once and don't make all this fuss. <laughs> a pretty thing it would be if a man of business had to examine every cab horse before he hired it. The man knows his business, of course. There, get in and hold your tongue. My gentle friend had to obey and box after box was dragged up and lodged on the top of the cab, all settled by the side of the driver. At last all was ready, and with his usual jerk at the rein and slash of the whip, he drove out of the station. The load was very heavy, and I had had neither food nor rest since the morning, but I did my best, as I had always done. I got along fairly till we came to Ludgate Hill, but there, the heavy load and my own exhaustion were too much. I was struggling to keep on, goaded by constant chucks of the rain and the use of the whip, when, in a single moment, I cannot tell how, my feet slipped from under me, and I fell heavily to the ground on my side. The suddenness and the force with which I fell 
seemed to beat all the breath out of my body. I lay perfectly still. Indeed, I had no power to move. And I thought, now I was going to die. I heard a sort of confusion round me. Loud, angry voices and the getting down of the luggage. But it was all like a dream. I thought I heard that sweet, pitiful voice saying, Oh, that poor horse. It is all our fault. Someone came and loosened the throat strap of my bridle and undid the traces which kept the collar so tight upon me. Someone said, He's dead. He'll never get up again. Then I could hear a policeman giving orders. But I did not even open my eyes. I could only draw a gasping breath now and then. Some cold water was thrown over my head and some cordial was poured into my mouth and something was covered over me. I cannot tell how long I lay there, but I found my life coming back and a kind voiced man was patting me and encouraging me to rise. After some more cordial had been given to me and after one or two more attempts, I staggered to my feet and was gently led to some stables which were close by. Here I was put into a well-littered stall and some warm gruel was brought to me, which I drank, thankfully. In the evening, I was sufficiently recovered to be led back to Skinner's stables, where I think they did the best they could. In the morning, Skinner came with a farrier to look at me. He examined me very closely and said, This is a case of overwork more than disease, and if you could give him a runoff for six months, he would be able to work again. But now there's not an ounce of strength in him. Well, then he must go to the dogs, said Skinner. I've no meadows to nurse sick horses in. He might get well or he might not. That sort of thing don't suit my business. My plan is to work them as long as they'll go and sell them for what they'll fetch, at the knackers or elsewhere. If he was broken-winded, said the farrier, you had better have him killed out of hand, but he is not. There is a sale of horses coming off in about ten days. If you rest him and feed him up, he may pick up, and you may get more than his skin is worth at any rate. Upon this advice... Skinner, rather unwillingly, I think, gave orders that I should be well fed and cared for, and the stable man, happily for me, carried out the orders with a much better will than his master had in giving them. Ten days of perfect rest, plenty of good oats, hay, bran mashes with boiled linseed mixed in them, did more to get up my condition than anything else could have done. Those linseed mashes were delicious, and I began to think, after all, it might be better to live than go to the dogs. When the twelfth day after the accident came, I was taken to the sale a few miles out of London. I felt that any change from my present place must be an improvement, so I held up my head and hoped for the best. At this sale, of course, I found myself in company with the old broken-down horses, some lame, some broken-winded, some old, and some, I am sure, it would have been merciful to shoot. The buyers and sellers, too, many of them, looked not much better off than the poor beasts they were bargaining about. Coming from the better part of the fair, I noticed a man who looked like a gentleman farmer with a young boy by his side. He had a broad back and round shoulders, a kind, ruddy face, and he wore a broad-brimmed hat. When he came up to me and my companions, he stood still, and gave a pitiful look round upon us. I saw his eye rest on me. I had still a good mane and tail which did something for my appearance. I pricked up my ears and looked at him. There's a horse, Willie, and has known better days. He put out his hand and gave me a kind pat on the neck. I put out my nose in answer to his kindness. The boy stroked my face. See, Grandpa, how well he understands kindness. Could not you buy him and make him young again? Do ask the price, Grandpapa. I am sure he would grow young in our meadows. The man who had brought me for the sale now put in his word. The young gentleman's real knowing one, sir. Now the fact is, this dear oss is just pulled down with overwork in the cabs. He's not an old one. What is the lowest you will take for him? said the farmer. Five pounds, sir. That was the lowest price my master set. Tis a speculation, said the old gentleman, shaking his head but at the same time slowly drawing out his purse. Quite a speculation. Have you any more business here, he said, counting the sovereigns into his hand. No, sir, I can take him for you to the inn if you please. Do so. I'm going now. They walked forward and I was led behind. 
The boy could hardly control his delight, and the old gentleman seemed to enjoy his pleasure. I had a good feed at the inn, and was then gently ridden home by a servant of my new master's, and turned into a large meadow with a shed in one corner of it. Mr. Thoroughgood, for that was the name of my benefactor, gave orders that I should have hay and oats every night and morning, and the run of the meadow during the day. And you, Willie, said he, must take the oversight of him. I give him in charge to you. The boy was proud of his charge and undertook it in all seriousness. The perfect rest, the good food, the soft turf, and gentle exercise soon began to tell on my condition and my spirits. During the winter, my legs improved so much that I began to feel quite young again. The spring came round, and one day in March, Mr. Thoroughgood determined that he should try me in the Phaeton. I was well pleased, and he and Willie drove a few miles. My legs were not stiff now, and I did the work with perfect ease. He's growing young, Willie. We must give him a little gentle work now, and by midsummer he will be as good as Ladybird. He has a beautiful mouth and good paces. They can't be better. Oh, Grandpapa, how glad I am you brought him. So am I, my boy. But he has to thank you more than me. We must now be looking for a quiet, genteel place for him where he will be valued. One day during this summer, the groom cleaned and dressed me with such extraordinary care that I thought some new change must be at hand. Willie seemed half anxious, half merry as he got into the chaise with his grandfather. If the ladies take to him, said the old gentleman, they'll be suited, and he'll be suited. We can but try. At the distance of a mile or two from the village, we came to a pretty low house with a lawn and shrubbery at the front and a drive up to the door. Willie rang the bell and asked if Miss Bloomfield or Miss Ellen was at home. Yes, they were. So whilst Willie stayed with me, Mr. Thoroughgood went into the house. In about ten minutes he returned, followed by three ladies. One tall, pale lady wrapped in a white shawl leaned on a younger lady with dark eyes and a merry face. The other, a very stately-looking person, was Miss Bloomfield. They all came and looked at me and asked questions. The younger lady that was Miss Ellen, took to me very much. She said she was sure she should like me, and I had such a good face. It was then arranged that I should be sent for the next day. In the morning, a smart-looking young man came for me. At first he looked pleased, but when he saw my knees, he said in a disappointed voice, Oh, I didn't think, sir, you would recommend my ladies a blemish Doris like that. Handsome is as handsome does, said my master. You are only taking him on trial. And I'm sure you will do fairly by him, young man. And if he is not as safe as any horse you ever drove, send him back. I was led back home, placed in a comfortable stable, fed and left to myself. The next day, when my groom was cleaning my face, he said, Oh, that is just like the star that Black Beauty had. He is much the same height, too. I wonder where he is now. A little farther on, he came to the place in my neck where I was bled and where a little knot was left in the skin. He almost started, began to look me over carefully, talking to himself. White star in the forehead, one white foot on the offside, this little knot just in that place, then looking at the middle of my back, and as I'm alive, there is a little patch of white hair that John used to call Beauty's threepenny bit. It must be black Beauty. Why, Beauty, Beauty, do you know me? little Joe Green, and he began patting me and patting me as if he was quite overjoyed. I could not say that I remembered him, for now he was a fine-grown young fellow with black whiskers and a man's voice, but I was sure he knew me, and that he was Joe Green, and I was very glad. I put my nose up to him and tried to say that we were friends. I never saw a man so pleased. In the afternoon I was put into a low park chair and brought to the door. Miss Ellen was going to try me, and Green went with her. I soon found that she was a good driver, and she seemed pleased with my paces. I heard Joe telling her about me, and that he was sure I was Squire Gordon's old black beauty. When we returned, the other sisters came out to hear how I had behaved myself. After this, I was driven every day for a week or so, and as I appeared to be quite safe, Miss Lavinia at last ventured out in the small, close carriage. After this, it was quite decided to keep me, and call me by my old name, 
of black beauty. I have now lived in this happy place for a whole year. Joe is the best and kindest of grooms. My work is easy and pleasant, and I feel my strength and spirits all coming back again. Mr. Surrogate said to Joe the other day, In your place he will last till he's twenty years old, perhaps more. Willie always treats me as his special friend. My ladies have promised that I shall never be sold, and so I have nothing to fear. And here my story ends. My troubles are all over, and I am at home. And often, before I am quite awake, I fancy I am still in the orchard at Birtwick, standing with my old friends under the apple trees.